my guest tonight is Dan Brock from Tucson, and we are going to discuss a ports. It's a subject I've just gotten into. I'm fascinated with it. I met Dan at a uh, small lecture I was giving in the Tucson area, and he showed me some incredible stuff that um, maybe we'll discuss tonight. And I'll find out from Dan what he thinks is going on, because it sounds like you've probably researched this a little bit longer than I have. And I'd like to get your input on what you think this is all about and why we're getting these things and what it means for the world of UFOs. Absolutely. Well, it's a, a fascinating experience that I've had um, in the years that I've been involved in the phenomena. My interest in UFOs goes back to childhood. Uh, my mother used to say anything to do with space, that's what I'm interested in. And um, as I got a little bit older, I was uh, more interested in UFO phenomena and uh, non-humans, and I was really big into science fiction. And uh, that sort of um, uh, became a sideline interest, and I sort of put that away. And then a <clears throat> number of years later, back in about 2004, um, I was living and working in uh, Los Angeles uh, in the film industry, and um, I was working on a project of my own uh, to create a script about the genesis of the UFO cover-up, and to make a mini-series uh, out of that was my objective. So I started doing a lot of research into the phenomenon. I went back and read books by Donald Kehoe, and got really engaged in phenomena. Well. Um, one of my friends that was in Los Angeles uh, with me was a former student uh, that I'd met in 1999. So it's going to be 20 years this August, actually. I've known uh, Paula. And um, uh, Paula comes from a fairly unusual family um, in that, and in part, uh, I guess, Western European. Okay. And um, so in, in a way, uh, she's a very different sort of person. And her father uh, and his family had quite an interesting uh, lineage. Uh, there was uh, masonry on uh, the father's side of the family. Um, there was um, uh, uh, individuals involved in various military programs on the father's side of the family. The father himself was uh, involved with a defense contractor doing high-level engineering work uh, for a major defense contractor. I'm not going to give any... Uh, specifics, uh, but definitely a person of interest, it would seem, on the father's side of the family. On the mother's side of the family, um, it uh, seemed to come from a primarily a sort of uh, rudimentary Asian community. And this included midwives and, you know, all the sort of uh, naturally uh, occurring uh, medicine man, shamanistic type work that um, <clears throat> went on in those Asian communities. So somehow she represented, uh, in some of the work that I was doing, um, to look at her situation from a non-physical standpoint. One of the things that I do is I work in the physical and the non-physical, and the non-physical is a term I use to describe, you know, sort of anything where I'm doing a projection of my consciousness into a non-physical state. So some of the common terms may be uh, out-of-body experience, uh, astral projection, uh, remote viewing, uh, any number of those different types of phenomena <clears throat> is uh, the name that I would that could be given to what I do. I just choose oh. to call it working in the non-physical. So in my work in the non-physical, what I sort of discovered is um, because this uh, friend of mine, uh, Paula, was having a lot of interesting experiences, and they seemed to be correlating at some level with me. They, she was communicating with them, uh, with me about her experiences. Um, there were some experiences that involved apparently what were what would be classic ET abduction uh, phenomena. Um, including me being in proximity to that, and the only missing time experience I've ever had was uh, involved in a situation where she was sleeping in the same room that I was in. So there's been a number of things on the abduction ET side of uh, her experience that I think, to me, validates that uh, there's an interest that uh, non-humans have in her. Now, when I ask about this in the non-physical, what I was getting was that uh, she... Uh, is sort of a natural hybrid, and they're, we're interested in following her development because the 
pattern of her uh, background being both Asian and Western European uh, represented a natural hybrid in, in the eyes of the non-humans that were observing her and following her. At least this is the information that I was able to get in, in asking that in the non-physical. Okay. Now, um, I guess the f one of the first things that, uh, that happened that I can recall was back in about 2005, there were several instances. She'd always expressed a, a propensity towards psychic phenomena, that she had a sensitivity, that she was something of an empath. She said she couldn't I remember her saying early on she couldn't remember her dreams, and um, she would only remember dreams when there was a death in the family associated with the dream, and it would be sort of a foretelling of a death occurring in the family. And she had uh, sort of an empathetic kind of sensitivity to other individuals and uh, she would for instance in one of her um, uh, boyfriend's um, uh, homes where she visited the parents um, she said that she would sit in the chair and she would start in the house and she'd start crying and she's like why am I crying while I'm sitting in this chair and it turned out there was a very elaborate story about the father of her boyfriend at the time cheating on the mother, the mother sitting in the chair and being distraught over the fact that this was going on and waiting for the father to come home. So there was this emotional sensitivity uh, that was produced that she was very sensitive to. Mm -hmm. um, then one of the instances that she specifically mentioned to me early on uh, involved um, going with her parents to uh, view a house that they were considering buying in Southern California. And in viewing the house, she was about to go into a bedroom, looked into the bedroom, decided not to go into it. The realtor then saw her looking into the bedroom and was very curious about what she had um, seen in the bedroom. So she approached her after the, the, the showing of the property. It turned out that there, there had been a suicide in the property and the um, uh, site where she had seen a what she described as a shadow on the floor was the place where the body had been discovered in the house uh, where the suicide had occurred. So she seemed to have a natural sort of psychic ability. And um, then I began working with her and she was a close friend of mine over a number of years and she was present for um, some of the ups and downs in my life. And in one particular instance, um, she was helping me through um, a difficult time I was going through where I was planning on moving from California and I was in the process of disposing things and she showed up one day and she said well I woke up with this strange mark on my leg and what she had was um, on her left um, her left leg close to the knee there was a circular impression with a sort of geometric pattern of dots inside of that uh, circle which was really unusual. I haven't I haven't seen that described in other uh, ET abductee phenomena or any kind of interaction. Then not long after that, I had an experience with her where she was helping me. Um, this was about a year later, helping me move uh, some materials from California to uh, Arizona. And we got in really late at night. It was about four o'clock, 4.30 in the morning, went immediately to sleep. I woke up at uh, 8 o'clock knowing I had a lot of things to do that day and um, she was sleeping on the couch in the room next to me. Uh, the space next to me is actually one large studio uh, structure. And I looked over at her and she was sleeping on her side. And I got up, looked at the time on the clock and it was about 8 o'clock and I said, well, I'm going to lie back down for just a couple of minutes and I'm going get to get up because there's a lot of things I have to do. And I went back to the bed, was lying in the bed, and I was thinking about the things that I had to do, and it was sort of a continuous consciousness process for me. So I was thinking about, in order, the things I needed to do, and I maybe spent 10 or 15 minutes, I thought, doing that. And then I said, well, I guess I better get up and get started. So I got up, and I went to my phone, where I looked at the time, and it was 9 o'clock. It had been 8 o'clock when I lied down before, and I couldn't have been in the bed for more than 10 or 15 minutes. And um, I went to my computer, I went to several sources of time and discovered that, you know, an hour or 45 minutes to an hour had basically disappeared. And at the same time that I saw this, I looked over at her, which I thought about 10 to 15 minutes had gone by, and she was lying on her back with her mouth open. 
and her head back. And I was like, what is this? And um, I got busy, took off, did a bunch of things during the day, communicated with her, came back, and she said she kept having this feeling that there was something between her teeth. And she kept flossing, couldn't get it out or whatever. And I said, well, let me take a look at it. And I told her the circumstances under what had happened that morning. She said, well, maybe the aliens got me. And I said, well, maybe they did. So we, we took a mirror and I looked in her mouth and there was a small blood dot in her mouth behind one of her upper molars. And it was perfectly circular. It was a circular indentation with a, with a point in the middle. Uh, like there was a dot, and there was a little bit of blood right where that dot was at. And she kept feeling like there was something in her in her mouth. Um, and uh, we sort of went about our business that we had to do that day, because we were we'd moved stuff to Arizona that day, and then we had to go to another part of Arizona that night, so we were immediately out on the road. And um, at one point, we decided, well, you know, we want to take some pictures of this, so we went to a Walmart to try to take... Um, get a mirror to take some pictures. We walked into the Walmart, wandered around, we're talking, walked outside, and then we said, well, wait a minute, what did we go in the Walmart for? We completely had forgotten it had been suppressed that we had gone, we're going to go into the Walmart to get a mirror in order to take a photo of this impression in her mouth, this um, uh, spot. And then by about, uh, that was all at about noon, and then about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, the spot in her mouth was completely gone. It was wow. no, nothing visible at all. Wow. So um, that was uh, about 2009. And uh, what's happened since then is um, she has had a series of events that have uh, involved either materialization or manifestation of objects or the moving, moving of objects in her environment. Um, and this has been uh, fairly disturbing to her. So uh, one of the first instances I remember was Paula uh, calling me in the middle of the night and she was on her way to Las Vegas and something strange had happened in her car. She said she had the impression of a dark entity in the seat next to her and she decided she would pull over and as she was pulling over one of the uh, she had a fob on her keychain that came off of the keychain and was on the edge of her seat about where your knee might be on on a seat and she looked over and she said how did that get off my keychain because it had to be physically worked off the keychain so this was like the one of the first instances she had of having this kind of experience and um, so the key fob was uh, there and it was actually a little cassette that said music equals life and it was the image of a of a cassette audio cassette um, and this really disturbed her because she couldn't explain to her, herself at all how this object uh, suddenly appeared on the seat next to her and it was disturbing enough to see the dark image in the seat next to her uh, which she couldn't explain but it disappeared or it was not visible once she had moved into the light where she had pulled over um, I mean that was about uh, I believe that was probably about 2010 or so, 2011, somewhere in there. And it's sort of accelerated since then. And um, she's had a Did number... You, can I ask you a question? Did you know what this was? Did you sort of recognize... Uh, did you Like, I didn't know about this uh, port thing till, you know, name-wise till six months ago. So when she's describing to you, do you sort of have any inkling as to what this might be? Or is it just another bizarre ufo related phenomena well at the time this is um, my my evolution personal evolution with the understanding or my understanding i guess i should say of ufo phenomena et abduction um uh, uh non-physical aspects of who and what we are and how we interact with that was evolving at the same time that all of these things were happening with her so my sort of take and uh, awareness of what was happening with her uh, was kind of limited at that time. It was only until recently in, in the latter years where I've been able to look more deeply and to, to try to get an idea what okay. was the nature of this. So okay. at the time we were uncertain. This was like 2007 to 2009, 2010, right in that time period, what was going on with her. We felt okay. like it was ET, but we, we weren't certain. Um, so I communicated with her about this a number of times, and we talked about it. And then I actually witnessed something in about 2009, 2010, where we were meeting some folks for um, lunch or breakfast, actually, in Los Angeles. I was visiting there with her. 
she was meeting a couple that had done their own energetic work and were involved pretty heavily in making documentaries and uh, had written a book and done a number of things and she drove a separate car to get to the restaurant got to the restaurant came in sat down and she uh, for some reason reached into her bag to get something and she pulled out her keys and she said oh my god look at this and there was a um, a business card that had been attached to her key ring <laughs> and there was no way that a business card could have without being folded and bent and there was a hole in the business card and it was just perfectly placed onto her key ring and it's right there in the restaurant in front of all of us and I had I said okay let me look at that and I needed I wanted to look at this and see what it was like and um, I don't think I even have a business card here but um what was interesting about it is I looked very carefully at the hole and it was like the circle that the uh, key ring had been put through had been shaved so it was very fine and the paper had been shaved down to a fine circular uh, edge on the inside but there was no creases no bends nothing that would have allowed the card to be slipped into the key ring without you know damaging the card Wow. And uh, it was it was uh, that was like one of the first major things, and it was with a bunch of people witnessing it, and uh, she was quite surprised about it. And then it sort of accelerated from there. You know, there was a bit of a, a bit of a gap in uh, some of my connection and, and communication with her uh, about some of these experiences. They they did sort of uh, continue. Uh, one of the turning points that she experienced with this phenomena was about 2012 where she had gone to sleep and uh, she had woken up and a necklace that she was, was wearing was in her sock <laughs> and so she woke up and she f was like well, where's my necklace and she felt something in her f touching her foot and she reached down and her necklace had been moved from around her neck to inside of her sock <laughs> And that's you know seems very playful, but you know it can be very disturbing if you're not okay. expecting that kind of thing. <laughs> so uh, it was that was interesting. But then what happened after that is something else happened. Uh, about I think this was a few months later, a similar situation had occurred, but she found a metal a piece of metal in the shape of a horseshoe. It wasn't very big. She said it was about like a wire for a, a retainer that you would have on your teeth. It was in her sock, but there was a blood spot. There, there was a triangular or, I can't remember if she said it was rectangular or triangular blood area where there was an outline on her foot. And okay. she was a little disturbed by that because that meant something had pierced her skin and that there was something else going on. Mm -hmm. So she became uncertain about it. At that point, I still... Uh, wasn't going deeply into her situation in the non-physical but uh, you know from there the things sort of um, accelerated and what I was able to get is that uh, she had this uh, Asian background and part of this phenomena was coming from her connection to uh, her ancestral past and it was either a, a family relationship somewhere in the distant past that was in the non-physical, uh, some uh, person, uh, a, a female entity is what I kept getting, that was interacting with her, trying to get her to move in the direction of taking responsibility for her skills and developing her skills because she was a very she's a very skilled, uh, sensitive individual, but she's chosen to completely ignore those abilities that she has or work on developing them so it was constantly trying to put situations into her, her experience that would spur her into thinking about uh, the phenomena in terms of her relation to it relationship to it mm -hmm. the some of the other things which I have some photographs uh, I can I can send you and, and you can share with folks um, you know, some fairly simple things happen, and, and this happened repeatedly, where, for instance, she would have a bag and there would be a tie that was put onto a zipper, and then she would go to get the bag and the tie would be gone, and she would look in another bag and there would be that tie, that little leather piece that was tied onto the zipper end, in another bag, and she'd, you know, so how is this possible? 
Um, there was one instance where she used a set of headphones uh, all the time, and she went to get the headphones, and she pulled on it, and it was attached to the bag, where the headphones is passed through the eyelet of the zipper, uh, wow. the catch, and there's no way without spreading that apart that you could get the the continuous wire of the headphones through that so it was literally passed through it somehow and those sort of things were happening all the time around her then recently and these were some of the photos that i shared with you in uh, when you were in tucson back earlier this year um she called me one morning she said i had something really strange uh, happen when i got home and that was that she'd gone into her bathroom in her in her home and there was a pile of dirt on the floor and this pile of dirt or so it seemed like dirt was not very big it was maybe maybe uh, two inches high about maybe three to four inches um, uh, wide but it was almost like the sand in an hourglass that had come from uh, a higher point and dropped and, it and this mound had been allowed to build and of course she looks up and there's nothing there and she can't see any source for any of this and she's wondering, how did this show up in my bathroom? So it was, that was a case of m sort of materialization, or if you want to call it an apport from someplace else, somebody was taking something from some other place and sending it to her location. Then here's what happened after that, which was quite fascinating. She got home, she saw this uh, situation in the bathroom, she just left it, and she decided that well you know I'm, i've got other things to do so she went out to lunch and she was having lunch and she was talking with a friend uh, at lunch she went to get up and underneath her in the booth that she was sitting in was more of the same soil sort of gravel and it had manifested underneath her while she was sitting in that booth in the restaurant which was a total surprise to her. She, in fact, looks over and the woman that was cleaning the table winds up cleaning the, the uh, seat off and is brushing away the dirt as she is able to snap a photo. Um, but it's um, from the color and the texture and the size and the granularity of the soil, it's the same type of soil that was in the bathroom. Yeah, I remember uh, you showing me that. That that was pretty bizarre. Yeah. I remember you, yeah. Wow. Uh, she was she was quite struck by that uh, experience because it was a public you know experience that she had. Um, then she went home and she decided, well, I I need to you know store this stuff and and sample it. She she got a scoop and she started going through the sand and she discovered, which I have a photo of it as well, a small disc that looks almost like a like a candy like a Mentos, but it's like it's sheared. And one part of it has a little semicircular piece that's moved off to one side. And I couldn't understand what the significance of this was. Uh, I was trying to imagine where this could have come from and what it was related to. It looked almost like it was a um, you know, compressed uh, powder of some kind. Uh, it didn't look shiny. It wasn't shiny. I'm not sure if it was stone. Uh, I don't know any further details about it, but she put it into a bag along with this soil, and I said, you have to send that to me so that I can get it analyzed and find out where this stuff is from and what's in it. And uh, she said, okay, I'll send it to you. And that was uh, this past fall of 2018, and I'm still waiting for her to send me the uh, the soil so I can uh, do some research and try to try to figure it out. But there was something interesting that I did uh, get from the photos. In the photos that I looked at, uh, that I received from her, of this pile of soil or gravel or whatever it was, I zoomed in on it and discovered that there were fairly large, almost like stones, that it was not a sand as in a fine sand, it was like a, a collection of stones and it wasn't dirt either because these stones were all different sizes. And within those stones, I saw some white objects. And in inside of this pile of dirt was a tiny piece of double terminated quartz crystal. I was like, what, what does this mean? And I, I, I really have no idea. But it was, uh, it was quite fascinating to me to, to discover that. So I'm, I'm hoping that she still has uh, this, uh, this sample and she can put her hands on it and, and get it to me somehow, even if I have to go out there and get it. Uh, because I, I would like to, to take a closer look at this and, and look at that piece that she, she found and, and see what the, the source is there. Um, 
so those were sort of the the experiences or some of the experiences she's she's had she's had a, a number of other ones um which she's communicated with me as well here was one that did happen that um was um a little disturbing to her she operates um a um uh something like an airbnb in some of her spaces where she uh rents out some of the rooms to guests and stuff uh in in the business that she works in and um so she's always sort of you know uh cleaning up and setting spaces and uh putting out you know all of the little complement of uh, things that you need for a room and she was cleaning up a room and she had some towels that she wanted to take into one of these rooms and 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 it's this the same house that she had the experience with the soil appearing on the ground and she had a towel over her arm and she took the towel and her tradition was to put the towel set on the bed and she takes the towel off of her arm she puts it on the bed she walks out of the room she walks back into the space where she originally got the towel and the towel is back on her arm again she turns around she says well wait a minute i thought i put this in the bedroom i'll go back and put it in the bedroom she goes back and puts it in the bedroom and makes sure that it's on the bed she walks back and then she looks up and she has the towel on her arm again she says wait a minute i know that i put this towel on the bed so she goes back to the bedroom again she puts the towel on the bed she takes her phone out and she takes a picture which i don't have a picture of the towel on the bed she leaves the room is walking out of the room and the towel reappears on her arm again (laughs) and she was just beside herself she's like what is going on here and uh, i told this story to uh, somebody that i work with and they said they said, I never want to hear about this again. This is too weird for me. <laughs> so there was obviously some sort of message that uh, somebody was trying to get to her about, uh, uh, you know, the the space, the towel, the uh, accommodations she was making for someone else. And um, or they were just trying to get her attention. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but uh, that was a fairly recent uh, occurrence that she experienced. So the moving an object from one place to another and the the um, uh, manipulation of our perceptions so that we don't sense it until it's there. We don't sense it manifesting, or at least that she said she didn't know it was there until she pulled her hand up and she could see that the towel was actually there with her. Uh, so there was definitely some manipulation of her perception that was going on along with the, 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 the telekinesis or the psychic movement of the object. Um, there is one example uh, that I can give of a friend of mine. This was in um, um, Suffolk, Virginia, uh, back about 2013. And it was a gentleman I knew and his wife and four kids. And um, I uh, went there for a visit, visited with uh, all of them uh, one evening. And the next day, it was just me and the, the wife there at home. So we began talking and she began telling me some of the uh, situations that they had experienced in their home which included these various paranormal experiences and um, uh, one of the things that she mentioned to me she had a son who was about 15 I guess 14 or 15 at the time and he had suddenly manifested severe migraine headaches and uh, he would be talking and all of a sudden his language would become nonsensical. He apparently had a very high threshold for pain and wasn't telling them that he was having migraines, but he would have them and it would reach a point where it would distort his ability to communicate. And they knew something was going on and they said, well, what's going on? He says, well, I have, a, I have a real strong pain in my head. And uh, she described this to me, um, the situation with her son. But then she said, well, there was another situation that we had uh, that involved this son a number of months uh, earlier. Um, And the scenario was basically the father had gone out uh, to a store and bought one of these uh, 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 memory foam pillows. 
and he started using that. And then one of the kids, they had four children, really liked it, and uh, then another kid used it, another kid used it, so they all wanted. So he said, well, all right, let's just go out and I'll get everybody pillows. So he bought the whole family these uh, memory foam pillows. And um, the uh, young, uh, young man, the son that had had the migraine problems, um, he had gone to bed with his pillow, and he woke up, and some other things had gone on in the house, but in this specific, specific instance of a paranormal nature, uh, in this specific instance, he woke up one morning and went, went down to his mom and said, Mom, my, my pillow's disappeared. I went to sleep with it last night. It was under my head, and I woke up this morning, and it was gone. And she said, what do you mean it's gone? And he said, the pillow's disappeared. And she said, well, we're going to find that pillow. And she said they started in his bedroom and looked everywhere in the bedroom for the pillow, under the bed, in the closet, everywhere. Then she, at that point, because she'd had other experiences in the house with paranormal phenomena, uh, things appearing and disappearing, she said, we're going to tear this house apart and account for this pillow and figure out what this pillow is. She said she spent an hour going over the entire house looking for the pillow, couldn't find it anywhere. Accounted for all the other pillows except for the one that this kid had slept on. And then a little while after she'd stopped looking and she said she was just sitting thinking about this, the son yells out to her, comes downstairs and says, Mom, the pillow's on my chair next to my bed. <laughs> and so this pillow had spontaneously appeared on the uh, chair next to his bed. And she went up and looked at it, and she said, that's impossible. How is this even possible? And um, one of the things that, uh, because at that time I would begin to work more in the, the spiritual realm and the non-physical realm, and I very quickly realized, you know, there's someone trying to communicate with her about the pillow. And I said, let me ask you, when did that pillow dis uh, disappear? And she said, that was in uh, June of 2013. When did the headaches start with your son? He said, the headaches started in the beginning of July of the same year. And I said, well, this could very well be the meaning of the pillow disappearing, that some entity is trying to communicate with you, there's something with the head, because the only play, only thing you do with a pillow is you put your head on it. And if the pillow disappears, it's to draw attention to what you do with the pillow. And so this was one of the modes of communication. I sort of realized that uh, the entities can use to communicate with people um, is to move objects around in their space that symbolically sort of represent something going on with them. And so I've used that as kind of a basis of interpretation um, over the years with uh, hearing about different phenomena that people are, were experiencing. Uh, there was one couple I met here in town who had a lot of strange phenomena going on in their house, and they kept having lights flickering on and off in one of the bedrooms, only one of the bedrooms. And when I took a look at the situation in the non-physical, um, it turned out that there was a uh, deceased husband of the person that was sleeping in the room that was trying to get their attention about a problem in another area of the house. Mm -hmm. At least that's the information that I got. And it turned out, yes, there was something else going on in the house that involved uh, an ET contact of some kind. Um, and I worked with them with a couple of other things that they were also experiencing. So um, it seems that if, if you think of it in terms of a hierarchy, in terms of planes of existence, um, uh, you know, disincarnate spirits, uh, spirits that have uh, sort of come back to communi communicate with us that are from a human form or trying to, in some instances, they're able to manipulate an environment and create a situation where they're trying to draw attention into the physical that we can understand. Um, and some of them uh, are able to accomplish that in, you know, more sophisticated ways maybe than others. Uh, but it's very confusing for us because we're not really taught how to uh, understand that and how to interpret it. So yeah. I don't know if any of this information is useful to you, but uh, I thought it worth sharing. Um, Absolutely. I mean, that, that's uh, fascinating. You have to apologize for for laughing, but it, it when you're on the outside, it does seem pretty bizarre. And I don't know whether you've talked to her, but it made me maybe share some of these other experiences of these other people. Because when you see this stuff, it's just like, it's just really, really weird. And and from the outside, you wonder, like, what is going on here? And uh, so my, I guess my first question would be, have you sort of sort of um, explained to her that other people have this same sort of thing, that this is not 
really that uncommon. It's, it's in fact, it's becoming less, um, it's more common than I ever thought possible. I, I didn't think this only happened once in a while. I'm starting to realize this happens a lot. And because a lot of people, when, when it happens to you, you have no idea what's going on. It's like you're losing your mind or what's going on. So the comfort to understand that, yeah, this is this is pretty bizarre, but there's a lot of people who've got just as bizarre things happening. You know, the example I showed you was some of the, the latest ones where, I mean, you, if you were to tell a person the story, they would just think you're, you've totally lost it. And yet some of this is caught on film. As you've got film, these people have it on audio tape. And uh, we're starting with the technology to be able to document it. And so that would be my first question. And the other thing, I guess, I would ask you, and I think you've already pointed this out, your interpretation of it. I think maybe I was even given that lecture in Tucson, the idea that it's the theory of wow. It's like a lot of what seems to be going on is trying to get people's attention in terms of showing you stuff and, and trying to uh, mo move you in a certain direction whether it's through dreams or this kind of stuff. So I don't know if she's had dreams or um, a lot of people talk about the dreams, the synchronicities that seem to link into these things that sort of also try to direct you in a certain direction. Yeah, this, this is very true. Um, you know, um, synchronicities uh, seem to abound in this um, uh, one young lady, uh, Paula, in her life. Uh, she just is constantly pointing out synchronicities. Um, and she's had some um, vision, visionary experiences of uh, the matrix, uh, if you want to call it that, um, uh, in the environment around us uh, that we're all sort of, uh, you know, uh, at some level connected to. Um, the, the interesting thing is, you know, some of the synchronicities, they spill over in, into my experience. My experiences um, involved um, uh, synchronicities associated with her, and some of them has to do with her uh, empathic ability. Uh, one of the instances is a, um, uh, a situation where I was in another state, and I was on sort of a vacation doing a little bit of work, and I was just kind of hanging out, and all of a sudden this wave of anxiety comes over me. And I'm like, for about three hours, I'm like, what am I doing? Where, 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 I have no idea why I'm here. Everything was just sort of didn't make any sense. And I was just wanted to hide. And then about you know, three hours after that came on, it was just gone. And I was like, well, what was that all about? And um, about two days later, I talked to my friend Paula and I said, and uh, she said, oh, I had the worst anxiety experience the other day, and I just couldn't believe, you know, that I, I knew what I was doing. I didn't have any, I had this fear of everything around me, and I just wanted to cower into a hole. And, and I said, was it about two o'clock on Tuesday? She said, yeah, that's when it was. And it was like, so we were having, I was picking up on her vibration. And so we were having this sort of synchronization uh, between the two of us, me having an empathic uh, response to her and her projecting her consciousness. Um, but specifically for her, in terms of uh, understanding this um, and other individuals understanding it, I, I think it's very challenging because we don't, we're not given, um, you know, it's, it's not part of our you know, childhood upbringing typically to, to get the language and, and the understanding of how this stuff uh, works and what it means and that the nature that there of reality involves more than just the physical experience that we're all a part of. So I think that uh, she recognizes that and so she's able to, to um, interpret beyond just the physical in terms of oh well there's other things going on and there's something in the non-physical that's interacting here and so she doesn't have a um, a, a direct fear of it uh, as such as such except when it's been you know you know significantly different uh, experiences that she's had that indicate something perhaps is going on and specifically of an abduction uh, you know ET or non-human abduction type uh, phenomena um, but other individuals, um, the, the challenge for them is, uh, again, they don't have the knowledge or understanding of this kind of interaction, and they're trying to figure, out, figure it out on their own. 
and you know we hear some of the stories and it becomes you know because we get it in the media all the time almost comical the recounting of the experiences but it's not for the individuals it's very frightening because it's disconcerting to their experience of reality so you know for the the challenge everyone has is to integrate these kind of things into a broader understanding of the nature of our reality uh, and be willing to do that and a lot of people just i think um, for their uh, personal, cultural, and uh, social experience, uh, that's something that they're not um, gravitating to. They're not gravitating to a, uh, a broader interpretation of what's possible in, in our experience of this, this reality. Um, and it, a lot of that's tied to belief systems that people have. So, you know, I, I, my hope is, is that, you know, these kind of experiences as we, uh, the work that you're doing to try to get information out there about this and recounting the different experiences that people have is going to help to bridge that gap. And, you know, here's a huge range of um, uh, experiences that people have had and phenomena that have gone on around them that uh, we can talk about and we can try to integrate into a, a deeper understanding of the nature of reality. So hopefully this is uh, building a little bit more comfort um, in, in the yeah. population. I, I think it is helpful and I think you're right and even myself like I, I you know 1974 so I almost you know 45 years at this and it was only in the last year that I sort of realized there was manifestations in a port I sort of knew there was these weird things that happened but I didn't realize the significance and even if you get for example uh, the rest of ufology and Jacques Vallée points this out he said when it comes to Skinwalker Ranch we've had everything at Skinwalker Ranch except for UFOs and you look at the book and you look at what they're looking at and everybody's talking about UFOs and, and the ATIP programs there and, and all this sort of stuff. And it's all, and you look at it and it's like, no, it's all a port material. It's what you and I are talking about. You know, the groceries back in the bag and the, the bulls in the trailer. And it's, and then you see the DIA goes in there and they're looking at it, not from the UFO point. They're looking at how do you make stuff go through a wall? How do you make the pillow disappear and come back into the room, you know, an hour later and stuff like that. So even the UFO community still can't catch on. They're still talking about, skinwalker ranch as if it's a ufo thing and it's it's this other bizarre phenomenon and that's what valet pointed and i remember i used to think valet was totally crazy i mean this guy's lost it i mean you know it's very evident this is et's coming from wherever and when you start looking at it there's this whole aspect of 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 the world that that even the ufo community is totally ignoring they, they think it's still spaceships with anti-gravity engines in them and stuff like that and the rest of the stuff it's like you know don't tell me about this other stuff whatever and yet when you start looking at it uh, i almost say and, and i think you probably agree that the more you look at it the phenomena the less physical it looks and the more spiritual it starts to look and people don't really want to deal with that yet because we're still into capitalism we're into materialism we're into you know have you know the big house two cars and we're into that sort of world and so when that physical world sort of changes where suddenly something physical happens that shouldn't have happened it's like it, it just i can see it would just totally destroy people's idea of am i going crazy or what's going on here but the more you look at the phenomena the more you see that this is a, a part of it and it may just be that they're trying to get our attention, even where Jacques Vallée pointed out, and I only learned this maybe in the last three weeks, a month, where he said, if you look at the UFO sightings, they're all different. So when you get a military sighting, the UFO is sitting there hovering off the coast of California for a week in one spot until they actually see it. And it's sort of then it drops from 80,000 feet down to 50 feet above the water and it just sort of flies around. That's not what experiencers get. Experiencers get, you know, this sort of uh, missing time thing and, and that's different. And then you get the orbs and the crop circles are different. And it depends what kind of experience or where you are that all UFO sightings are different. Like the same as Skinwalker Ranch, it's completely different. There really are no UFOs there. And so you get these different things. And like, so UFO starts to become like 20 different phenomena. And it depends whether you're a military guy, an experiencer, uh, you know, just uh, uh, somebody looking at crop circles or whatever it is, that you have all these different things. And even myself, just in the last couple of weeks, I started to realize, yeah, this guy's right. The, the, the UFOs are not consistent across the spectrum. There's different phenomena. And now I'm learning this thing with the, uh, the apport phenomena where you get uh -huh. these things. It's the more you look at the evidence, you realize that 
this is absolutely for real because a lot of people start to photograph, they start to document it, and there's a lot of people running around, but they, they don't really even talk about it. I didn't know the word, and I have have a guy that, I don't know if you've seen his, Dave Edmonds, I have his his, uh-huh. his interview up. And he had these things, I, and I would say to him, I like everybody else, that when I talk to an experiencer, I say, you ever have anything fly through the room or something appear out of somewhere? And then Dave said, when I was interviewing, he said, oh, I'm going to go to my next room. Can I can I go get something? And he comes back, oh, these, these collect, and he didn't know what they were, but he was collecting them. <laughs> you know? And I think a lot of experiences do that. They, they, they have a box full of these things. Yeah. And they think it may be from their dead grandmother or wherever it's from. They don't know what's going on, but they've been collecting it. They know I got to collect these things. This shouldn't be happening. So uh, I, I think that what you're you're contributing here is again one of the more bizarre stories. And it may be that this will be very helpful because there's almost this expression you've heard it that unless the story is really weird, it's not true. And because the story is so weird, that what what Paul is experiencing. People will listen to it and they don't realize they're actually learning something. They're going to say, well, you know, that's pretty weird. Tell me another story. And you tell the stories and that's what they're doing. They're providing these stories that are giving people a wake up call. And all it is is to get the breadcrumb is to make you go like, what's going on? What are these people experiencing? And it moves you out of that material paradigm to say, maybe something's going on. And when you figure it out yourself, oh, it must be this. Then you get the idea. But if they were to come and land on the White House lawn and say, here we are, everybody, everybody's just going to ignore them. It's sort of like you come to the conclusion yourself. And it's that so it's that messaging thing with I think you and both I both agree. But I think the stories that you've told that Paula's experiences and you can thank her for those because they are ex- experienced. People will just will sit up and they'll go like, wow. I mean, some and that that's why it is. It's almost like I always say the thing like with I always say to Linda, how why are cattle relations bloodless? Because if they were right. bloodless, nobody would pay any attention. They want it to be really, really, really weird, and and because no, otherwise you're going to say ah, it's just something else. And when you when you like the business card thing you explain, you're going like, could be something else. And you're going, no, it's no, not something else. No. It's, it's like, not something else. <laughs> so yeah. that, that's and 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 the thing with the apports that you can maybe Paul to point out to her too is they're not predictable. And I've never seen one the same. They're always different. And they and they and you maybe can tie it into me that it seems to tie into the person that, you know, it, it ties into their personality. It, it ties into what's going on in their life and, and these kind of things. It's, it's almost like it's personally made for that person. And it's a matter of trying to figure out what what that symbol means. Like, why is she getting dirt? Whereas somebody else gets little raw, little polished stones or marbles, Chris Blesso got marbles. Why Why are these different things? But the, the apports are never, I've never seen two of the, the same. They're always different. Right. Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something really interesting that happened to me. Uh, this was on Friday. Um, I was messaging Paula about uh, the, the interview that I was going to do here with you and talking about the photographs and wanting to share them and share the stories. And I sent her a, um, a text saying, Oh, you have to give your permission for me to use these photos and we want to come up with a name that we can use and, you know, all of this various things. And I hit send on the text at the same time that I hit send, I had a rock appeared in my shoe. Oh, wow. And I was walking home. I was doing the message while I was walking home. And all of a sudden, I feel a rock in my shoe as I hit send. I went to the side, pulled my shoe off, and I couldn't find the rock. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, how did a rock get in my shoe? I'm in a building all day. Uh, I haven't walked on any gravel. Uh, I haven't been near any gravel, but there was a rock in the bottom and it was touching the sole of my foot. So that to me was an example of the kind of uh, synchronicities in combination with uh, the apports that's possible, uh, where there's some kind of communication maybe going on there between me and her and whoever is uh, trying to communicate with her with these apports. I'll give you one more instance. In fact, I just remembered I have this behind me. Right here. This is um, my grandmother, who I was very close to. She used to collect dimes. Wow. And um, she had this jar. This was her jar, and there's dimes in here going back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, on up until she died, and I think it was 82. 
and I kept this jar. Well, I have a little collection, and I've put some in there. Every time a dime appears in my environment, and I suddenly look over, and there's, how'd that dime get on the floor? I will pick up the dime, and I will include it in this jar with these other dimes. And I always say, thank you, Grandma, for messaging me and sending me the dimes. And um, I, I get the message sometimes that, oh, my, you know, something's going to come through or a dime is going to come through, but I don't see anything. And then I'm walking or I'm doing something or suddenly there's a dime right in front of me. And I look down and, and uh, I always pick it up. And it's one yeah. of those uh, little personal things that I do. I can't say that it's an apport. I, it's maybe a synchronization uh, between me and this uh, idea about my mother, my grandmother collecting dimes or whatever it was. But it's one little thing that I do that sort of... Uh, keeps me thinking about the non-physical and my relationship to it. So now every time I see a dime on the ground, I think, ah, my grandmother's trying to communicate with me and tell me something. Maybe she is, maybe she isn't. I, I, can, I can tell you that you are the sixth person to tell me the exact same story. Exact same story. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, what you should be watching, and maybe I can ask you, heads up or heads down? Yeah, it's usually heads up. Heads up, always heads up. There's a there's a, a video you can watch on the internet. Go, um, uh, par the Paranormal Rangers. Ah, or the ah. Oh, Rangers. Yes, it's yes. The, the haunted place, uh, and they have 64 coins in one weekend. All heads up in yep. this building, yep. and they're falling on people's heads and stuff like that. Um, so I'll I'll tell you a synchronistic story. I was I I, I lectured. Just before I lectured in Tucson, I was lecturing at Paula Harris's conference, and that's when I got into the Aport thing. I had this synchronistic event where Ray Hernandez had told me the story in in LAX airport, and this guy that he's got this experience, he's got these things appearing and swords and all these stuff, and he's got this whole shelf full of all these things, and I'm going what? And and I'm, I'm and then I'm thinking about the metal from the 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 to the stars. This idea, you know that. There's pieces of metal falling off flying saucers. And I'm going, yeah, yeah. no, it's not falling off. It, it, it came across the galaxy. There's no pieces falling. It's like they're throwing this stuff down. This is, And I asked Hal Putoff about this. I said, Hal, do you think this is a ports? Because they had these things at, at when Yuri Geller was at SRI in the 1970s. This stuff was falling yeah. in the labs. So um, I got fascinated. So just before the Paula Harris conference, which was the beginning of number, November, and I lectured years later in November, but... Um, the, it was, um, I, I, I said, well, I'm going to check this out. So I'm, I'm at a hotel two days early. I get on the internet and I say, a ports um, and UFOs. And up pops this um, lecture by Stanley Krippner. I don't know if you've heard this story. So Stanley Krippner is on this lecture and he's talking about these ports and he's dealing with some guy by the name of Amadin from Brazil, a Brazilian psychic that had 95 things appear. I think they were there for 10 days with a crew, with cameras and all this sort of stuff. 95 things appeared in, in, these, in this period of time. They could not film anything. They never saw anything appear. It would fall behind them, always behind them and stuff like that. And so then he said, well, I had all these supports and then someone broke into my house and they stole them. And so what I did, he said, and here's the synchronicity. So I'm, I'm looking at this video and he's telling this thing. And he said, so he said, well, what I did is because they, I didn't want to lose the next ones, I had a couple more collections of apports that I'd gotten one from this Brazilian guy and one from a shaman in the United States, Western United States. I sent them to the university of Manitoba in, in Canada. Mm -hmm. I worked there for 37 years mm -hmm. and I went, there's a collection of apports. I'm, I'm in the apport thing. And suddenly I realized where I work, there's a collection. <laughs> there's only two in the world. There's one at Stanford university, wow, which I'll wow. see in August. I happen to be going right past Stanford university in August. And so I'm going to see the second collection and the other collections at my university. So I went and so I go, I got to do the story. I mean, I, this is intended for me to do. There's no way it's a coincidence. So then I went and then I told the feather story. I think I told it in Tucson, the thing with the feathers, uh -huh. all these people with feathers. And then we were in Tucson and then we got the feather and um, but when I was lecturing at um, at Laughlin, I'm all excited about the, the I changed my lecture and I changed. I put all the apport stuff in the lecture. I said, you got to hear these stories about these apports. It's amazing stuff and real bizarre stories like the ones you're telling tonight. So I tell these stories and I come off the stage and uh, 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 Steve uh, Mira is standing behind the, the 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 curtain there and he says, you stole my lecture. I'm going to be talking about a ports too. And I went, you are? 
And I'm thinking like, you know, and he gets on the stage and he, he tells the story. I mean, he's talking about his reports and they've done research on objects that have, that have actually apported. Like they got two mugs so they can compare the one mug to the other mug. And he's, yeah. he does all this research. The next guys that step up to lecture are guess who? The Paranormal Rangers. And they talk about, and I'm falling asleep in the lecture, and they talk about the 64 coins. So then yeah. that happens. Then I'm leaving the room, and I'm walking out of the room, and I don't know if you've ever been to Paula's event or to UFO Congress, and there's always wow. one guy working at the door. Right. Never, never talked to the guy in my life. He's always there every year. And he stops and he says, can I talk to you? And I go, yeah. He said, I got, I got, um, I got dimes. And I said, you got dimes? Really? He said, how many? about 40 and he starts telling me the story you close encounter as a, as a kid in michigan and these dimes are appearing all heads yeah. up and he's, and he's telling the dime story and then um he said and bob brown who used to run ufo congress yes he's got yes. dimes too and he tells me he's and i said he's got dimes and i know there's a woman i work at 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 ron mcdonald house and there's a woman there who is works as one of the uh the, the cleaners there and she starts telling me about the dimes and I said, you got dimes too? And she goes, yeah, my mother gives them to me. My mother signals. <laughs> and she tells these stories about yeah, these yeah. dimes, your heads up in, in, in different places. And she's just clean. She knows it's not. And then there's uh, Sid Goldberg from Gaia TV. Uh, mm -hmm. He put me in contact with a woman in Toronto. And I'm talking to her. And she, hers are like all, and again, all dimes. And the ones where it's in the middle of the bathtub. I mean, this kind of stuff where it's like you just you got – no question, but a hundred right, questions right. as to what's going on. So you're about the sixth one, and you've actually got them collected. Yep. So yep. I, I'm definitely going to use that photo because that, and it's it's almost never nickels or sometimes it's yeah, quarters. Yeah. But and, it's and, always and, and the thing that's dimes. interesting is I've added um, probably a couple of dollars worth of dimes over the years to this jar um, because it was not quite that full when I started off when my mother, my, grand, my mother gave it to me and I, I took it off the shelf of my grandmother's and uh, she said, Oh, well you can, you should have that. So anyway, that's a, that's a fascinating story. Cause that, that, yeah. that yeah. is the thing. And there's something about it. And, and a lot of people get the same idea that it's a message from a dead person. It's okay. And so you see exactly what the woman at, at, at uh, where I volunteer said, exactly what you're saying. That's was her interpretation. And she's had stuff even like she's had the thing with the hand where the hand wakes her up where she wakes up and, and there's a hand that, that just taps her shoulder and she wakes up. And so she's, she's got para, a little bit of paranormal, no UFO stuff and stuff like that. But it's almost like this and you probably the same thing is once you get into the synchronicity, then you start running into people with the ports and with dimes and, and, and these stories. And it's like every time you turn around, somebody's got another story, almost like the idea, you know, once you buy a certain type of car, then suddenly you see these cars all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I definitely think that uh, this, some of the synchronicities work in that way in terms of your attention is raised. And whatever you put your attention on uh, puts a certain amount of energy into that. So you sort of amplify the possibility for synchronizations. It's just like, you know, my amplification of the dimes uh, connection with my grandmother um, and this rock that appeared in my shoe and my connection with my, uh, my friend Paula. Um, you know, there, there was one um, uh, ghost story that I could tell very briefly um, that my, my, um, my sort of stepmother or surrogate mother, um, she's st uh, still around. My biological mother has passed a number of years ago, but um, uh, I was staying with her in her uh, farmhouse in North Carolina, and she had told me there was a ghost in the house. And uh, they had had a number of experiences uh, uh, with the, the ghost sort of manifesting a physical touch of people and that kind of thing. And as it turned out, there was a gentleman that had killed himself in the house, committed suicide in the house, and they suspected that this was the source of the, uh, the ghost entity that was there. And um, I was in, in the process of learning about how to, this was about 2007, I think, something like that. I was in the process of learning about this non-physical engagement and how to access that. And I was, um, um, went to bed one night and apparently for me, and it, this can vary a little bit from person to person as to what they experience in dreams, because sometimes your dreams have connections to these non-physical interactions. Um, I have had a particular sensitivity of being in different places where there has been a residual presence or something there that somehow comes through to me in the dream.
in a dream state. I'll have a disturbed dream state and I'll think, wait, there's something going on here in this space and then I'll work in it in the non-physical, uh, doing a working meditative approach and discover, yes, there is something going on there. But anyway, I was at my mom's, my surrogate mother's. I call her my mom now because I've known her for 45 years or something. Um, uh, I was at her place, and there was this ghost that she said, oh, we have a ghost in the house. And I, I said, okay, well, you know, I'll be on the lookout. I didn't really sense anything, but I heard the stories. One person came in who said they were painting on the stairway and suddenly felt a hand grabbing their uh, leg from behind. They looked behind, and there's no one there. And then uh, some other instances of people feeling or sensing something physically present uh, in the house. So I go to sleep one night, and I'm having a dream, and I'm having a dream about somebody that I'm working with, and we're sitting in a car, and we're having a conversation. And all of a sudden, this sort of blackness comes over my dream and it's almost like um, watching a movie the dream is like watching a movie and then slowly it fades out and you get static and I remember having this sensation of something sort of moving in on me and as I woke up I could feel a hand cupping my testicles this was very unusual and very disturbing and I was like what is going on here? Yeah. And I was just like, okay, I think I know what this is, uh, but I'm not certain. And <laughs> I immediately began to work in the non-physical, and apparently this ghost was trying to get my attention. And uh, it was because he sensed that I was sensitive uh, and that I had an awareness of this non-physical presence, which he was a part of, and I was able to work with him and help him connect with his mother who had already passed and he was still somehow connected to the earthly plane and in the imagery that I was getting he was still dragging the shotgun that he'd used to kill himself in uh, the imagery yeah. as a ghost uh -huh. and but I was able to connect him to his his mother who came through it was the classic sort of you know hand coming from the the opening in the in the ceiling with the light coming through and he took the hand and was uh, sort of carried on into the non-physical and uh -huh. lo and behold no more trouble with the ghost at the house after that wow. so <laughs> that was really fascinating it was really caught me by surprise though when I was like waking up coming out of a dream and it's like something is touching wow. me in a private place wow. that was weird that's it <laughs> has pollock had any um sort of movement towards using her her abilities and these sort of things is she sort of has it changed her life in terms of getting the message as to what may be going on my experience has been years of communicating to her the, the, the trying to motivate her to do exactly that, to access her abilities, to learn to connect with them, to learn to develop them and embrace them. And so far, she has been somewhat reluctant to do that. I think for a lot of people, it's a similar situation where she's very successful in the work that she does. And yeah. it, it is incompatible with the environment where she spends most of her time. Yeah. So it winds up being a private thing between her and I. She doesn't even share this with pretty much anyone else, yeah. uh, what's oh, going on, yeah. because it's not yeah. something other people can ex explain or understand. Um, so that's been her experience. But she's recently connected uh, with a, a psychic, uh, a working psychic in uh, the area where she lives. And she has begun, I hope, on uh, working with that psychic in order to develop some of her abilities because the psychic is, look, you have these abilities. I can feel that you have it. You need to work on developing it. And hopefully that will maybe see a change in the type of phenomena that she sees. And I guess time will tell to see what actually happens with her. But I feel this is, uh, you know, the case for everybody. It's like, I don't really feel that I'm much different than anyone else, but I was very fortunate in 2000. Uh, I think it was 2006 I met someone here, um, I'm in Tucson, Arizona, uh, who was able to teach me about the non-physical and working in the non-physical. And um, I found myself really struggling and experiencing things that were obvious to me that it, 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 there was something going on in the non-physical that uh, was affecting me. And I would get the physical sensations of it and 
uh, in my communication with this individual, um, she would tell me what she had done and what she discovered, and then these stories would come out about aliens and UFOs and connections to the non-physical and patterns since childhood and things that have been on for a long time, and I finally removed them, and all of these things happening, and I realized, you know, the complexity of this is not for the faint of heart, you know. If you really get deeply into uh, trying to understand how the non-physical phenomena works in terms of your interacting with it. And the one thing that I learned is that when I'm working in the non-physical is I have to trust what I see, what uh, is revealed to me, because I carry with me my experience as an individual, my cultural experience, my social experience, um, and my knowledge of everything that, you know, for instance, all of the stories and, and accounts that you've had and what you've discussed um, and other people have uh, presented to me and talked to me about and my own experiences. So it's like this combination of all of these factors that determine how I interpret or how what's out there in the non-physical is revealed to me. And uh, that one fact has been the most useful because it allows me to both realize that what I see in the non-physical is not necessarily definitive, it's my interpretation of something. And somebody else will have their own interpretation of it, or they might see it in a slightly different way or a completely different way. Um, if you look at the evidence for um, near-death experiences uh, based on cultural differences, there is apparently a number of differences in how people perceive the afterlife in their near-death experiences based on their cultural background. So I think it's a similar thing in doing work in the non-physical. Um, and you can you can find yourself sort of polarized in one direction if you're primarily focused on the uh, ETs, non-humans, and the hybrid program and uh, other beings from other parts of the universe. Well, that's maybe what you're going to experience. If you're going to focus on a you have a more of a uh, Western Christian upbringing, it might be angels and um, uh, archangels and uh, the Mother Mary and any number of different um, forms that present themselves in a way that you can interpret it and act accordingly and do the things that you need to do. Um, but for myself, I think um, getting at a core level of understanding how to integrate um, what I've experienced with the physical world, uh, a lot of my understanding of that is coming now more through a deeper uh, delving into uh, Native American teachings and na Native, Native American cosmologies in terms of their view of the entirety of our physical existence, how that is a, merely a reflection of the non-physical and that we are all a part of that and everything that we experience above and below and in front of us is all a part of that. So I'm, I'm beginning to embrace that more. So in a daily existence, I'm, I'm wanting to believe that I'm, I'm feeling and, and seeing more yeah. of that non-physical aspect of what we are. But it does make it challenging because we got to exist in a 3D world that, you know, we're, we're taught from the very beginning about materialism, deterministic, reductionistic yeah. approaches to analyzing everything in our reality. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's at least hopeful that as you described, basically from say 2008, 2009 to now, your worldview, and I, I would say the same thing. It's like completely different. I mean, a to totally different person. I mean, we're moving along pretty fast in terms of if you stay open to what's going on, um, I think we're actually moving along pretty pretty fast. Maybe the rest of the world isn't, but I think you and I, and and it's like almost like the Bible says, too much is given, much is expected. That if you seem to have gotten something and figured something out, it's incumbent upon you to put it out there and the people who are waiting for that breadcrumb pick up that breadcrumb. You're not trying to convert anybody, but, you know, to put it out where people can pick up on it. And I, I think these these stories will will reach a lot of people because they're just so weird. I mean, people love this kind of stuff. They just they just can't get enough of it. And it will make them think it will make them, you know, question the regular world that they think is real that uh yeah so i'm 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 highly appreciative of these stories because these are these are some of the best that i've heard although every every day it's like you get some more and you're going like wow it's just you know just incredible 